Welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Today is the third uh, lecture in the series of infectious disease. Today's lecture will be carried out by Dr. George M. Welbis. He is a professor and head of the Department of Infectious Disease, CMC Vallo. He has done his ID training in Wayne State University, USA, and also in London School of Engineering and Tropical Medicine, UK. He is currently holding the position as a current a country ambassador of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. He has been also awarded multiple awards, including the National Award for Excellence in Clinical Research. He uh, he's also have many uh, publications, both national and international over 75 publications, and he's also having expert positions as a part of uh, ID, ISCM, and also in ICMR per se. Sir's lecture today will be on treatment of drug-resistant TB. I hope uh, it's going to be a very informative lecture for you guys. Sir has a uh, person, is a very approachable person and also very knowledgeable in his field. Uh, if any questions or queries, please drop, uh, drop it in your chat box towards the end of the session. This lecture will be uploaded soon in your uh, medicine website uh, in the YouTube. Any queries, you can either uh, forward it towards sir personally or maybe at the end of the session. Now over to sir. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Anju, for those kind words of introduction. This uh, topic is something which is extremely important, both for your clinical practice uh, as well as for your exams. So um, in addition, there's a, a large amount of uh, advances in this area, both in terms of uh, the way we diagnose and <clears throat> plan the treatment and the treatment per se. So what I would try and cover is uh, give you a brief summary about the burden of disease in India. How do you plan the treatment strategy using the current molecular diagnostics? What is the current WHO treatment recommendation for uh, MDR, TB, and other drug-resistant tuberculosis? Uh, shorter MDR, TB uh, regimen, where would you use it? And what's the, uh, the current recommendation? And also, we have our uh, RNTCP uh, PMDT um, program, uh, uh, programmatic management of drug resistant tuberculosis guidelines. Uh, the, the guideline was formulated in 2017. And uh, I'll just briefly touch upon the important aspects of the guidelines. And uh, lastly, the newer treatment options for uh, MDR TB and other drug resistant tuberculosis. As um, we know that uh, TB is one of the uh, major infectious disease burden in a country like ours. Globally, there are about 110, uh, there are about 10 million uh, cases of TB with uh, uh, 1.4 million deaths, which occurred in 2019. You may have seen the, the WHO Global TB report, which came out about a month ago. And uh, this talks about uh, in detail, what is the current uh, scenario? I'll just give you the summary. Now, uh, if you look at the TB word burden globally, uh, over a quarter of that burden is uh, in uh, India. Compare that with our neighbor uh, uh, who has much lower uh, proportion with uh, very comparable population of the denominator. So we have a long way to go. Um, look at the, the number of deaths due to uh, TB, uh, roughly about uh, 445,000 deaths, uh, which occurred in uh, 2019. Compare that with uh, uh, that of COVID, uh, roughly about, uh, 144,000 uh, deaths um, in the since the pandemic has begun. Uh, you can see that TB is no more in the news, but uh, in spite of having huge um, burden um, of disease and also mortality, roughly uh, you know over thousand people die of TB every day in our country. Look at the burden of uh, MDR-TB. 
India again um, has uh, more than one fourth of that burden, um, uh, the the of the global burden, um, and compared to the other two regions, which is. Uh, China and um, Russian Federation, where they, the, the proportion is uh, uh, reasonably high. Uh, in terms of numbers, India constitutes um, more than one-fourth. Now, uh, if you take uh, globally the new uh, TB cases, roughly about uh, 3% uh, of those are MDR-TB, and in the uh, previously treated ones, uh, about 17 percent. You can see that um, only less than 40 percent of the MDR-TB is diagnosed. And among those who are diagnosed and treated, the treatment success is about 57 percent. So we have a um, huge amount of work to be done and there's a significant gap in terms of identifying and also uh, treating them uh, successfully. Now, when you look at um, MDR-TB and its outcome, it also depends on the, the, um, uh, the subgroups, particularly the ones who are resistant to fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides um, have a lower, uh, success rate, HIV, who, uh, individ I mean, individuals who are infect infected with HIV, who are not on ART, um, have very poor outcome. So it is important for us to recognize um, uh, over and above just a programmatic management, we need to recognize the, uh, the markers of poor outcome. We need to um, uh, target the individualized therapy in, in many of these patients. And I'll come back to some of those uh, uh, eventually. When we are talking about um, drug-resistant TB, you should be familiar with some of the terminologies. When we say monoresistant um, uh, TB means that uh, resistant to one drug, usually INH monoresistance is the most common one. And uh, when we say MDR-TB, it's resistance to uh, INH and rifampicin. XDR or the extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis is MDR plus resistance to fluoroquinolones uh, and uh, at least one of the injectable agents, uh, which is amikacin, canamycin, and capriomycin. The terminology extremely drug resistant or TDR or XXDR um, it refers to resistant to all commonly tested drugs. Now this is becoming uh, redundant uh, because there are newer drugs which are coming out uh, where the, um, uh, this will be effective. When we say primary drug resistance, uh, it means that uh, new, uh, newly diagnosed cases um, with uh, MDR-TB, usually this is uh, an individual acquiring the um, infection from somebody who's got uh, drug resistant TB. When we say uh, secondary or acquired drug resistance, we mean previously treated patients uh, with poor compliance, uh, they developed resistance um, uh, to um, uh, the drugs which they are on. Now, when would you suspect MDR-TB? If there is history of uh, prior uh, treatment, TB treatment, it's a powerful predictor of uh, MDR-TB. You should suspect in those. Uh, also, if there is non-adherence or default or substance abuse, these are indicators that they could be having uh, uh, drug resistance, failure of treatment uh, uh, where the sputum uh, smear or if they continue to be uh, smear positive in spite of uh, two or three months of therapy, exposure to possible drug resistant case uh, and also persisting symptoms 
uh, and lack of sputum conversion. These are the situations where you would suspect uh, MDR-TB. And today uh, you have newer tools, the tools where you can recognize uh, surrogate markers of MDR-TB, which is the rifampicin resistance mutations. Uh, and that is becoming um, uh, very common and uh, it's a good way of uh, not only diagnosing TB, but also uh, diagnosing MDR-TB at the get-go. So when we talk about uh, uh, diagnosis um, of drug resistance uh, in TB or confirming the drug resistance, we usually confirm it by culture and susceptibility methods, which is the phenotypic uh, methods, and also the molecular test, which is the genotypic uh, method of uh, drug resistance detection. As you're aware, for over uh, uh, um, uh, uh, more than uh, 100 years, there has not been much progress in terms of diagnosis um, and further uh, recognition of this particular problem. Uh, till, uh, until about 10 to 15 years ago, where things have started uh, uh, changing. You can see that um, the uh, liquid culture uh, which came in and then subsequently the line probe assay and about 10 years ago, the, the NAT testing or the automated um, uh, PCR testing uh, called the gene expert, um, which uh, recognizes the not only the uh, the TB uh, DNA, but also the rifampicin resistance mutations, which uh, is a good surrogate marker for MDR-TB in 90 minutes time, where you have a, uh, a, a, a test which, is, which has got a very uh, quick turnaround time and uh, a test which is very accurate. Now, when we talk about the mycobacterial culture from the solid culture, uh, people have moved on to the liquid culture because uh, the turnaround time is shorter, the sensitivity is um, uh, higher. The automated methods like MIGIT um, are uh, commonly available now for mycobacterial culture and then subsequently susceptibility testing. When we say the nucle uh, nucleic acid amplification test to detect drug resistance and uh, tuberculosis, there are three uh, common methods. One is the gene expert, which uh, uh, I'll tell you a little more about it, and also the line probe assay, and the third, the sequencing-based assays. Now, this was a game changer about 10 years ago the publication in NEJM where um, uh, the um, um, established uh, um, evidence on detection of rapid, uh, rapid molecular detection of tuberculosis uh, and rifampicin resistance using the gene expert. Now, um, when you look at the uh, rifampicin resistance detection, the sensitivity is about 98% and the specificity uh, is uh, about 99%. So uh, the, the false positivity and false negativity rates are very, very small. But in somebody where there is no history of uh, uh, TB treatment earlier, or where you think that the, uh, the pretest probability is low, um, where the um, uh, gene expert um, detects rifampicin resistance mutation um, without these risk factors, um, this needs to be reviewed and you may have to uh, do another test or uh, retest to confirm uh, whether this is truly uh, the case, um, um, uh, whether this is MDR-TB or not. So to uh, give you a little more insight into uh, the gene expert and also the, uh, the line probe assay, the picture above is actually um, the area where the uh, gene expert machine targets the, um, on the um, RPOB gene 
in mycobacterium tuberculosis. As you are aware, um, MTB has roughly about 4,000 genes with 4.4 million base pairs. The RPOB gene codes for uh, about uh, 1,342 amino acids. So into three will be the number of base pairs, what you have. Uh, now this hotspot region, which is about 81 base pair hotspot region, starting with the uh, 505, when we say a number, it is the amino acid position. Uh, RPOB gene, which has um, 1,300 odd uh, amino acids, when we say 505, it means that 505th uh, amino acid. Uh, at that position, there is a mutation. So that uh, region uh, which has, um, in the RPOB gene, there can be multiple uh, mutations which confers phenotypic resistance to uh, tuberculosis. So this uh, whole uh, 81 base pair region is covered by five probes in a gene expert. This is the older gene expert. I'll come back to the uh, gene expert ultra in a minute. So the, these are overlapping probes. Therefore, you can detect the uh, mutations in that entire region. Now the picture below um, is again looking at the same region, but for the line probe assay, you can see that um, the, there is um, the um, uh, there are three hotspot mutations which occurs at the um, 516, 526, and 531. Uh, positions. 526, there are two important mutations. So these uh, three positions with uh, canonical mutations uh, confers high level resistance to, uh, to rifampicin, phenotypic resistance to rifampicin. Um, so these regions are, these um, uh, amino acid regions are covered by the uh, probe B, D, and E in the conventional gene expert. Um, and while on the other hand, a, the A and C, although it picks up uh, some additional mutations, they may not confer high level phenotypic resistance always. So you need to be careful if it's in the, if the mutation is in, uh, the region of probe A or C, which means that if there is a mutation in that region, it will not uh, bind, the probe will not bind, uh, and therefore that will be, uh, uh, the, the machine will detect as negative, it's not binding. Now, uh, when we talk about the expert ultra, they have actually, uh, Improve, improvised on that um, uh, conventional uh, gene expert. Again, RPOB gene, uh, it is um, uh, covering the same hotspot region uh, using four probes instead of five, four probes which are longer, but exactly the same region. Additionally, what it covers is uh, two insertion sequence, uh, sequences, which is uh, IS6110 and IS1081. Now, you uh, probably know that these insertion sequences, there are uh, multiple copies of um, uh, 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 all these uh, tandem sequences are present uh, in the genome that actually um, improves the sensitivity. So the detection of um, MTB uh, is better. So there is uh, roughly about uh, 17 to 20% improved sensitivity, but there is a slight compromise in the uh, specificity. There is a, um, a small amount of false positivity which comes along with it. So when, uh, if your institution is using um, expert ultra, you must remember that you need to correlate uh, when you have a, um, a expert ultra, which is positive and trace means that it is binding to the insertion sequence 
um, if it's uh, uh, it, uh, low, medium, or high, it is actually uh, the RPOB gene. So when there is trace positivity, you know that this is um, uh, binding to the insertion sequences and therefore false positivity can be there in a smaller proportion. Now, line probe assay is essentially, um, it, it's once the DNA is extracted from the sample, uh, there's amplification um, by PCR and there is uh, hybridization using multiple probes. And then these are evaluated. Uh, the line probe assay, you have the, uh, uh, this is Heinz uh, line probe uh, genotype MTBDR plus looks at the INH and uh, rifampicin uh, mutations. Uh, on the other hand, MTBDR SL, um, which is the second line uh, version one initially, um, and now version two, detecting the fluoroquinolone and the injectable drug uh, resistance mutations. You can see that the sensitivity and specificity are reasonably um, high. The uh, improved version of version two, there are additional uh, mutations which are uh, covered and therefore the, the, there is uh, better accuracy and detection. When we are talking about the drug resistance mutations, you need to know the important mutations for um, INH um, uh, or the isoniazid, you, have, you can have CAD-G mutations or INHA mutations. Rifampicin resistance mutations are on the RPOB gene. We have talked about the uh, hotspot region of uh, 505 to 533 multiple mutations and uh, um, yeah, we, how do we apply these? I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. For fluoroquinolone, it's primarily gyre and also gyre B. Uh, for aminoglycosides, RRS mutations are important. You may also find EIS promoter mutations in uh, canamycin. And um, understanding some of these mutations are important for uh, clinical uh, treatment decisions. Now, when you are looking at the, uh, the INH uh, mutation, as I said, if uh, there is CAPG mutations, uh, you can use uh, ethionamide. On the other hand, if it's uh, um, INH uh, A mutation, um, the INHA and CAG, uh, you uh, will not be able to use um, uh, isoniazid and ethionamide. If it is only INHA mutation, you may be able to, um, um, uh, you, you will be able to uh, use um, 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 high dose uh, INH uh, in uh, CAG mutation. Uh, and not in INHA mutation. When we are talking about the uh, rifampicin resistance mutations, the mutation um, in um, uh, 2A, 2B uh, mutations and also mutation three, uh, it confers resistance to rifabutin as well. Um, the, uh, if it is, uh, 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 the mutation one, which is at the 516th position, uh, the rifabutin may be active. Uh, now, as I said, if it's uh, binding outside these um, uh, canonical mutation areas, um, there may be a uh, situation where you, uh, it may be false uh, positive, um, uh, like in 533, you might be able to use rifampicin or rifabutin. When you're looking at the um, GAIR A mutations, mutation one and mutation two, you can use high dose moxifloxacin. If there are any GAIR A mutation, you will not be able to use levofloxacin or ofloxacin. It confers resistance to all of them. 
um, while if it is guy ray mute one or mute two, it is um, uh, you can use high dose uh, floxacin for the treatment. When you're looking at the uh, the aminoglycoside resistance, if it's RRS mutation, you will not be able to use any of the aminoglycosides. On the other hand, if it's EIS promoter mutation, uh, you will be able to use amikacin or capreomycin. So some of those uh, uh, mutations, looking at the mutations on the line probe assay, you can actually tailor your uh, uh, regimen um, more appropriately. Um, and uh, by the time you have the culture and susceptibility report, uh, it will be about uh, uh, at least uh, two months. Uh, by then, you can actually um, make a significant difference, both in terms of outcome and also spread of the infection. You must also remember that um, um, uh, you know, the uh, MDR-TB resistance mutations, INH monoresistance um, uh, occurs before that. So CAT-G mutation, they have uh, uh, associated, uh, or this has been found to be the harbinger mutation that precede MD MDR-TB um, on large number of isolates across the world um, and therefore, INH monoresistance, again, you need to recognize and treat them appropriately. Now, sequencing-based uh, technologies, um, either Sanger sequencing or the next-gen sequencing using um, pyrosequencing or other technologies, uh, you can actually detect various mutations uh, on the genome. Uh, the commonly used mutations, known mutations are uh, with rifampicin, INH, fluoroquinolones, and uh, injectable agents. Uh, now, the way things are going, it's like in HIV treatment, uh, genotypic uh, resistance mutations will dictate uh, the treatment choice in, in uh, mm -hmm. uh, many of the patients. Uh, uh, from the beginning, up front, you can use this. Now, when you come to the MDR-TB treatment, uh, uh, which uh, again has been evolving very rapidly, as you know, the uh, 2019 guidelines, WHO guidelines reclassified all the second-line drugs. Now, this is... Um, uh, was mainly based on the efficacy uh, of the drug. Um, there are some, um, uh, you know, issues with um, toxicity. Um, in Group A, they have included the quinolones, bidaquiline, and linezolid. And uh, one has to choose all three drugs uh, if it's um, uh, possible. And Group B... Uh, you will choose at least one drug, which is clofasamine, which was uh, earlier much lower down in the list, um, or, or cycloserine um, from that group. Group C is all the other drugs, including uh, delaminid, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, um, amikacin, uh, and ethionamide. Now, um, up to eight months, um, with four or more second line drugs in the intensive phase, followed by a continuation phase of 12 months with three or more second line drugs is what is recommended in the current uh, MDR-TB treatment. Uh, this is based on um, uh, the efficacy evidence uh, which WHO has recommended uh, uh, since 2019. The summary of this uh, treatment strategy is that all three group A agents, uh, at least one uh, and at least one group B agent uh, should be picked up. Start with um, at least four uh, second line TB agents. At least three agents are included for the rest of the, uh, the continuation phase once the bidacoline is stopped. Key drugs uh, for the uh, key second-line drugs are bidacquiline, quinolones, and linezolid. 
the injectables, they have uh, put it lower down. Um, clofacemine and cyclosarine uh, are included. Kenamycin and caprimycin are not uh, um, uh, included in the list. The duration of treatment recommended is 18 to 20 months. Uh, treatment um, uh, duration of 15 to 17 months after culture conversion. Now, uh, there was a, uh, uh, an important trial which was published last year in NEJM uh, called the uh, STREAM uh, study. You're probably aware of this, where this is actually a modified Bangladeshi regimen where shorter duration of therapy in patients with uh, MDR pulmonary TB. So they looked at pulmonary MDR TB diagnosed by expert with no fluoroquinolone or aminoglycoside resistance by line probe assay. Their intervention was the modified Bangladeshi regimen for nine to 11 months. I'll come back to the regimen in a minute. Um, this, the comparative arm was the regular MDR-TB regimen for 18 to 24 months. The outcome they looked at was the, uh, uh, the clinical improvement with culture negativity at 2.5 years. Now, um, <clears throat> they um, uh, chose moxifloxacin. This is uh, uh, from the evidence of previous uh, Bangladesh uh, cohorts there were about three, uh, there were about six, six uh, uh, regimens in, in that uh, particular cohort. And this regimen is the one which had the uh, best outcome. So they chose uh, that modified Bangladeshi regimen with moxifloxacin, clofacemine, etambutol, and pyrazinamide, um, along with um, INH. Uh, uh, prothionamide and canamycin for the initial uh, four months of uh, intensive phase. So uh, total of uh, nine to 11 months uh, on an average 10 months of therapy is what they uh, used in this particular trial. You can see that uh, the proportion of individuals with HIV infection was comparable in both the groups. Uh, and uh, multiple cavities, again, in both groups, lung uh, cavities uh, were comparable in both groups, uh, and the uh, corrected uh, QT uh, interval uh, in both groups, again, were comparable. Now, the, um, uh, if you look at the result, they found a favorable outcome in 79.8% of patients in the longer regimen um, compared to 78.8% in the shorter regimen. No uh, uh, significant difference between the two groups. The side effect profile, again, in the longer regimen, 45% had the adverse events, uh, which is grade three or higher, uh, compared to 48% in the uh, shorter regimen. Um, uh, group. Now, uh, QT interval, uh, there was a, a difference, although statistically not very significant. 11% had um, QT prolongation in the shorter regimen compared to 64 in the uh, longer treatment group. Now, based on this, WHO recommended 9 to 11 months shorter duration of therapy. This is what we uh, follow in the RNTCP as well, um, provided they have uh, pure pulmonary disease. If they have extra pulmonary disease or disseminated disease, the, the shorter regimens are not recommended. And they are susceptible to both fluoroquinolone and second line injectable agents using line probe assay. Um, the, <clears throat> if the patients um, have had previous treatment with second line drugs for more than one month uh, with resistance to fluoroquinolone or aminoglycoside, extra pulmonary TB or pregnancy, they are excluded uh, from not receiving this shorter regimen. Now you can see that um, in the intensive phase of four to six months, uh, 
moxifloxacin high dose uh, along with clofacimine, pyrazinamide, uh, etambutol, and um, uh, were used um, in addition to um, the canamycin, ethionamide, and high dose INH only in the intensive phase. The rest of the uh, drugs were continued for another five months to complete the 10 or 11 months duration of therapy. Um, this, um, uh, when you look at the, uh, the RNTCP recommendation, uh, the PMDT, which is the programmatic uh, 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 multi-drug resistant uh, tuberculosis management, um, which was recommended in 2017, um, it is actually a slightly um, older recommendation where they say that patients ineligible for shorter MDR-TB regimen, um, where they, there is um, <clears throat> extrapulmonary TB or other than uh, plural and lymph nodal TB and pregnant women, uh, you would use the um, the conventional therapy, which is uh, initial six to nine months of uh, uh, canamycin uh, and pyrazinamide in the intensive phase, along with the other drugs which are continued uh, throughout the course, both intensive and uh, uh, continuation phase of 18 months. Uh, the drugs recommended are levofloxacin, ethionamide, cyclosarine, and ethambutol. Uh, you can see that there are uh, uh, several difficulties uh, in this kind of an approach, where the particularly uh, levofloxacin resistance will be quite high. Uh, there is an issue. And these, um, uh, on a programmatic um, approach, this is something which is reasonable, but um, uh, I think we need to um, uh, go further from this. Uh, however, for your exam, uh, and um, uh, it, you need to be aware of this regimen. Um, and when you see patients who are coming from the uh, RNTCP program, you should be able to recognize what are their regimens and how do they manage. Now, uh, bidaquiline is uh, one of the uh, drugs, although it was um, uh, FDA approved for TB since 1971. Uh, this is an AT ATP synthase inhibitor uh, with significant bactericidal activity comparable to rifampicin, INH, and pyrazinamide, and sterilizing activity comparable to rifampicin. Uh, this um, has gained... Um, uh, you know, the, the treatment recommendation in the recent past uh, for MDR-TB with uh, more evidence. And this was one of the um, initial studies. They looked at cure rates uh, um, over at 120 weeks um, uh, compared to the standard regimen uh, placebo control. You can see that the Bidaquiline had better cure rates compared to uh, the standard arm alone. Um, the QTC increase was much more common with bidaquiline, so there was a caution. Um, you need to monitor this um, if you're using bidaquiline. Now, uh, PMDT uh, indications for bidaquiline are uh, mainly two, pre-XTR or XTR treatment failure of MDR-TB. These are the situations where they use. You can see that um, the bidaculine containing regimens, what the national program recommends is uh, if there is fluoroquinolone resistance, uh, you give bidaculine for the initial six months and then um, uh, you know, the uh, four drug continuation phase for 18 months uh, if there is um, fluoroquinolone resistance. Uh, the without bidaquiline, uh, the you can see the alternate regimen where there is uh, moxifloxacin, uh, which is added to the regimen. Uh, similarly, the second line injectable agents, uh, the the bidaquiline, if it is available in the uh, intensive phase, 
um, along with the uh, quinolones, ethionamide, and uh, cyclosarine and linezolid in the continuation phase. Uh, and if you don't have, uh, you um, if uh, uh, the aminoglycoside resistance is there, they recommend capriomycin. Uh, one of the other important uh, uh, early evidence uh, which came out in 2012 was early bactericidal activity of uh, multiple agents. You can see this uh, uh, Noel uh, uh, PA824, uh, which is the uh, pretaminid, uh, had one of the best early bactericidal activities. So this uh, is a, this inhibits the uh, mycolic acid uh, uh, synthesis, uh, which is on the uh, cell wall, um, and uh, so this has actually. Um, become one of the key drugs for MDR-TB management. Uh, this um, um, publication, which was la uh, came out last year in NEJM called NICS-TB trial, looked at patients with XDR-TB or failed MDR-TB treatment. Uh, they used six-month uh, trial of pretaminid in combination with bidaquiline and linezolid, and therefore the regimen is called BPAL regimen. As you uh, are um, aware, the this is kind of a salvage regimen, and therefore um, you know you would think that um, the cure rates um, or the um, uh, the success will not be anything great, but this was. Uh, the the uh, the result was totally opposite. They looked at the relapse free cure. There were there were 109 patients evaluated six months after completion of treatment. Uh, just look at the favorable outcome. Uh, you can see that 90 percent overall cure when you look at MDR TB and XDR TB overall. Uh, cure is 90%. Only one had uh, relapse, uh, which had uh, um, uh, the uh, SNP uh, for bidaquiline resistance um, in that particular patient. So very impressive result with uh, the BPAL regimen or the NICS-TB um, uh, trial. When you look at the adverse events, what they used, um, uh, the, the linezolid which they used is 1,200 milligrams daily, either once a day or 600 twice a day. As you know, there's a very high dose. Um, uh, for shorter therapy, uh, we use this dose. But when you are using it for a longer therapy, you can see that toxicity is going to be an issue with peripheral neuropathy, myelosuppression, and optic neuritis. Now, uh, this has been one of the challenges um, of using uh, the BPAL regimen or the linezolid um, uh, uh, upfront for MDR-TB. I'm sure there will be more and more evidence which will come out. Um, the uh, two things, one, uh, do we really need 1,200 milligram uh, of linezolid uh, for um, TB treatment, uh, or like what we conventionally use, uh, somewhere uh, around 600 or 900, will we get away with it? Is something which we need to uh, get more evidence on. You also need to know the optimizing the dosage, moxifloxacin, for example, weight based. Um, you can look at the WHO. Uh, website, you can see that you, uh, the, the outcome can be optimized using uh, uh, the PKPD parameters um, in many of these drugs. You also need to, uh, to look at the, the site of action, the ATP synthase uh, in bidaquiline, um, uh, the uh, uh, DNA gyrase for quinolones, uh, so on and so forth. So for the exam, that is important. Delaminate is another drug which is again um, available in the country. There are um, uh, early trials which are showing benefit, uh, but I'm sure with uh, pretaminate um, that will become the 
the standard of care eventually. Uh, the other drug you should be aware of is um, sutasolid, uh, which is an oxazolidine known. Um, uh, now this is related to linezolid. The, uh, the toxicity is supposed to be um, uh, less compared to linezolid. This is a protein synthesis inhibitor. Uh, maybe we will have a better regimen um, um, where you need to use linezolid, particularly in pre-XDR or XDR, uh, sutasolid may be an option. There are trials ongoing. Uh, next trial, which is going on in South Africa, was supposed to finish in 2019, but it was held. Um, the, the results are not out yet. Uh, stream 2, uh, again, is ongoing. There are few <laughs> important, uh, drugs, uh, a few important drugs which are uh, 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 under trial. We will have uh, some of the additional um, um, uh, treatment trial uh, results available. Now to Michael, summarize, Michael. MDRTB in yeah, India is uh, under-recognized. Uh, newer molecular tools uh, aid in early and accurate diagnosis. Uh, there are uh, high confidence genetic markers of resistance uh, that can be used for patient management. Newer drugs and regimens offer better efficacy and tolerability. Um, shorter MDR regimen is uh, available for pulmonary MDR TB. Treatment with all oral regimen is becoming a reality. Um, you may have to choose um, the regimen based on the potency and the side effect profile uh, to optimize the outcome in an in individual patient. Thank you very much for your patient list. Thanks a lot, sir, uh, for that updated version of the treatment for a uh, treatment resistant TB. So, uh, any um, further in enlightenment into this TB PCR, which is done for extra pulmonary TB? Well, um, uh, extra pulmonary TB um, the, it depends on the sample. If you have a pus sample, uh, it is a, uh, the yield is extremely good. Um, if, um, on the other hand, uh, if it's CSF, the yield is uh, lower. So you should be uh, aware that um, in uh, samples where uh, the number of bacilli are smaller, uh, even if it is negative, it does not rule out. So uh, like, for example, in uh, uh, CSF, what people uh, optimize the uh, or, or improve the uh, pickup rate is uh, take about 15 ml of uh, sample, uh, CSF, spin it, uh, and do the uh, expert, you get more than 80% uh, uh, pickup rate. So the um, you can optimize. Uh, if you're using, say, lymph node, you should send at least one gram of tissue. Uh, that, again, will improve the yield. So if you're aware of um, the different extra pulmonary samples, uh, you can actually um, improve the yield, uh, even though uh, in some of them uh, it's, uh, the, it is lower. And so the line probe assay per se, are we doing? We're for, doing line probe. Uh, we do. For monoresistant TB? Um, so the as part of the uh, national program, uh, they have the line probe assay, which is uh, available for smear positive patients. They are smear positive. They will do directly from the sample. But on the other hand, if they are smear negative, uh, the uh, the yield will be lower, and therefore they may not. Uh, um, I mean, uh, the, uh, routinely they will not do it. Um, they can do it uh, once there is a culture growth. Uh, they can do it on that. So there's a question in the chat box. So can you please explain the reason for for 
false positivity results with trace positive in ultra dim pcr yeah so the um, we have actually just um, uh, um, uh, we are in the process of uh, completing the data collection but we know that um, there is um, uh, there is a, a false positivity it is not a lot it my guess is it will be somewhere around 5 to 10% it is uh, probably less than 10% but what is it? Um, there are two or three situations which we see. Number one is um, latent um, uh, TB. Suppose there's somebody with malignancy, you uh, pulled out all the nodes uh, and you did an expert. Uh, there is um, expert uh, TB positive, which is trace positive. Secondly, uh, patients who are uh, previously treated uh, patients um, are cured of the disease, but there is some DNA uh, remaining. You're picking up uh, that. And I also think that there are uh, more uh, reasons why there is uh, false positivity. Uh, we don't have good understanding of what all are the false positivities, but we know that there is a compromise in uh, 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 the specificity. So the next question, uh, so is it compulsory to do molecular tests for all suspects before starting ATT? Well, today I will do, when you say molecular testing, it can be anywhere from gene expert to line probe uh, and to sequencing. So uh, we can't club all that together. Um, when you're talking about gene expert, today the standard of care for diagnosis of TB should include gene expert. We should not um, uh, rely on uh, sputum smear microscopy um, or just the AFB smear, which uh, the uh, pickup rate is much lower and you will not have any idea about whether it is uh, uh, TB or NTM. You will not have an idea about whether it's susceptible or resistant TB, all that. All these information are available um, uh, with uh, Gene Expert. Just one test. Uh, I think that should be the standard of care today. Next question. Sir, bedaquiline and delaminide are readily available in centers in India and CMC. It is, uh, it is available. So they started off with uh, five or seven centers in the country. Uh, for the trial. Now they are, uh, they have made it available um, um, across the country in different uh, uh, centers. So they um, have chosen uh, at least one or two centers from every state uh, and it's available uh, uh, in every state. So one more question. So do we know for every extra 17 person of patients, detected to have MTB with the ultra over conventional expert, how many extra false positives are detected as MTB? Mm, uh, you can calculate, um, you know, the, the math. Uh, uh, so 10% of that 1.7% uh, may be false positive. So can we rely on CRP to decide on duration of continuation phase in disseminated TB? patients, both sensitive to first line and MDR TB cases? I don't think CRP is a good marker to do that. Uh, there are no um, good studies uh, showing that evidence. Sure. Any further questions? So I think uh, we'll wind up. This uh, lecture will be soon uploaded in your CMC website, YouTube. Any further questions, you can either meet sir in person or can be mailing it to us. The next session will be tomorrow by uh, Dr. Priscilla Rupali on antimicrobial stewardship. We'll wind up for today. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for Thank your you. time.